going to, okay, well today I'm going to stop with the imitation first of all. But today I'm going to show you how to make a first class lever at home. A first class lever at home. It's going to be such a good first class lever, you might call it a first class first class lever. So, in true joy of science style, I'm going to run all the items that you need across the bottom of the screen if I can figure out how to do that when I'm editing this video. But really, all it comes down to is you just need a spoon and something that can fit on the handle of the spoon, like this pen. So, here it is. And what I'm going to tell you is it's a first class lever because the fulcrum, the part that it moves around, is in the middle. This is the load, and here comes the effort. Well, that was a little accident. Well, anyway. Uh, Last science video for Sec 2. So this uh, is going to cover a few topics that we've done in the last couple of weeks. So it might go a little bit quick. Well, in fact, it's definitely going to go be, uh, quite quickly the way I'm talking. So if you want to see anything again, just pause it, move yourself around the video as you need to to answer the assignment. So first thing we did was we thought about simple machines. And I asked you this question about if we were back in school and you had to get to the second floor, normally, uh, you would be like student A and you would take the stairs. But um, what about student B who decides to climb a rope? Well, keep in mind, they're both gonna, we're saying they're both having a mass of 50 kilograms. And remember, we multiply that number by 10 to find out the gravitational force. That's what we have to overcome to get these students to move upward to the second floor. Well, student A, when they take the stairs, they've traveled. A longer distance than student B. When student B takes the rope, student B goes straight up. But which student had the easier job? Well, it's obviously student A. We prefer to take stairs and not climb straight up ropes. I wonder why. Okay, well, this is where the idea of simple machines comes in. What I want you to think about is that a simple machine like these stairs will make our job easier. It'll lower the amount of force that we need to input into something. Although, the way it makes up for that is it means we have to do this over a longer distance. But if we're doing something like taking the stairs, who cares? That makes our life easier. So, here are some simple machines that we talked about. First of all, just very quickly, a simple machine is any de device that allows you to use energy more efficiently. So we're not talking about big mechanical electrical machines here. We're just talking about nice, simple things like shovels. So the first one that I showed you was called an inclined plane. Really, all you need to know about an inclined plane is that it's a ramp. So if we had to lift this 10 kilogram box by up to this uh, height over here, well, it's remember we multiply it by 10, we've got 100 newtons of gravitational force to deal with. So lifting it straight up means applying 100 newtons straight up at least. But if we use a ramp, this ramp happens to be about 30 degrees, we can actually cut that force in half. Now, the disadvantage is that we're sliding this box over a much longer distance than just lifting it straight up. But if this is easier, I'm going to do that. Now, it's true, by the way, that there could be some friction here, which is going to make it a little bit harder than 50 newtons. We'd have to put in more force than that. But let's not talk about friction just now. So. An inclined plane is a, essentially a ramp, and it's a simple machine. It reduces the amount of force, but we need to import that force over a longer distance. For example, if you've ever seen a mountainous area like this, you could have one road that just goes straight up, but it would be really, really steep. It's much better to have these switchbacks so that we don't ever go too high up at once. But it's a much longer distance to travel. This ladder is a much shorter distance, but look at how steep a ladder is. A screw, by the way, you can think of as an inclined plane as well because it's threaded around. It's an inclined plane that wraps around the rod of the screw. So the second type of simple machine that we talked about were called levers. And the thing with the lever is that it's got three parts, a fulcrum, which is the part in the middle that it can move around, and the load, which is the weight that we're trying to lift, and the effort, which is what this person who just dropped down from the sky is uh, putting into the system. So that's the effort. This is the load. And of course, very realistically, that catapults the box perfectly to its position up there. Yeah. There is a 
joke about uh, weavers that I know I can hear you laughing from here. This was a situation I showed you that may or may not have been based on a true story about a science teacher having to help a friend move and nothing will make people invite you to move by saying, I'm showing up with my homemade catapult. Uh, so no, I didn't actually catapult my friend's TV into her apartment, but I did take it up the stairs uh, with no elevator to her sixth floor apartment. And by the way, TVs were much bigger back then. They were, uh, they're not as thin and light as they are now, let me tell you. Anyway, what I want you to notice here is that let's say somebody does this, they flip the TV, but not very far. What if we change the position of the fulcrum? What's going to happen now? Well, that didn't help much. In fact, that was even worse. But let's move the fulcrum the other way towards the effort. And let's try this one more time. And we send the TV flying over the building. So obviously, this is exaggerated. And I know I'm tall, but according to this, I'm like the height of the fourth floor. So I know this is uh, out, um, out completely exaggerated, let's say. But no need to worry about that. One other thing you can think about with levers is if you've ever been on a teeter-totter or something like this, and most of you told me you haven't, I guess they don't exist much anymore. Um, for it to be in perfect balance, ideally, you and your friend have the same mass, but you can kind of cheat that if you change your position. For instance, this is out of balance because I've got a 10 kilogram mass and that's a five kilogram mass. So it's out of balance. But if I move this one in closer, this is twice the mass, but if I make it half the distance, we actually bring this into balance. So we can adjust levers as well, not just by changing the position of the fulcrum, but by changing the position of the load. And then we're balanced. One other note about levers, by the way, to uh, keep in mind is that there's three different kinds of levers. And the only difference between the three of them are the position of the load, effort, and fulcrum. So when a first-class lever, like the teeter-totter I showed you, like me and the spoon, or Bob Ross, I should say, and the spoon flipping the pen up, that was a first-class lever. So we're teeter-totters and scissors because the fulcrum is in the middle between the effort and load. In a second-class lever, it's the load that is between the fulcrum and the effort. Things like a wheelbarrow or this nutcracker. And in a third-class lever, the effort is between the fulcrum and the load. So it's just based on the position of these three ideas. Things like barbecue tongs here or a hockey stick even count as a third class lever. So the next simple machine that we saw were pulleys. A pulley is a grooved wheel with a rope that runs through it and they can greatly reduce the amount of force we need. So if you wanna lift a car, let's assume that this car has a mass of a thousand kilograms. And no, by the way, this is not how people actually lift cars, but let's just assume. Uh, well, we would have to, First, multiply that by 10. That's 10,000 newtons of gravitational force that we would have to overcome. So let's say we have a rope. We could pull it straight up with 10,000 newtons of force, but none of us are that strong. So what if we put in a pulley? Does this make our life easier? How much force do we have to import now? Well, it's actually still 10,000 newtons when we put in this pulley. We may have made it a little bit easier because it might be easier to pull down on a rope than to pull up. But all we've done is change the direction of the force. We haven't lowered it. But something kind of cool happens when you add a second pulley. So let's do that. Let's add a, another one. And now, amazingly, the amount of force is cut in half much easier to lift. 5,000 newtons is still a lot of force, but much easier to lift. Um, but we had to use twice as much rope to pull it the same distance. But do we really care about the rope when we're lifting a car? If I add a third pulley, now I cut the original force in three. I use three times as much rope. If I add a fourth pulley, I've now divided the original force by four. I've used four times as much rope, however. And then five pulleys, you get the idea. I've divided the original force by five and I've used five times as much rope. Now, by the way, these pulleys in real life would probably be stacked on top of one another instead of all spaced out like this, but it's easier this way for us to see them. The other problem in real life is that there's friction between the pulley and the rope in a lot of cases. You try to reduce that friction, but anytime we build up friction, we're 
that's making our job harder again. So it would be, you'd probably have to apply more than 2000 Newtons actually in this situation to overcome the friction. One idea that I want you to think of before we move on to other stuff is the idea of mechanical advantage. So mechanical advantage is just the ratio you can think of, of which, how much did we uh, reduce our force by, let's say. So if we need 10,000 Newtons to lift this on, off the ground, well, with one pulley, we don't change anything. We'd say it's a mechanical advantage of one. But whereas we cut this in half, here with two pulleys, we have a mechanical advantage of two. You might say it's two times easier. This is three times easier, four times easier, and then five times easier with five pulleys. You're going to hear about mechanical advantage with every type of simple machine, not just pulleys. Very quickly, a couple of other simple machines that we saw. We saw wheels and, ac and wheels and axles. Let's try that again. When wheels rotate, so do the axles. Um, wheels, they're good. Yeah. What else? Wedges. A wedge you can kind of think of as a back-to-back -back inclined plane. They're useful for separating things like the, this wood that this person is chopping or even a canoe cutting through water. Cutting is maybe a bit of a weird word, but hey, let's say it. And then one more that I'm going to introduce to you that you'll work with a lot down the road down in the future. Gears. Gears are toothed wheels that can transmit rotational motion. Remember rotational motion from one gear to the other as long as they're connected. Interesting to note, if a gear is turning clockwise, then the other one, the adjacent one, the one next to it is going to go counterclockwise like you see here. By the way, the larger the gear, the longer it's going to take to rotate. The smaller the gear, the faster it'll rotate. I'll do that animation one more time. I know it's a little bit grainy on Zoom, but watch this big gear spin. The smaller one completes more rotations. Same thing here. Now, I'm not going to get you to actually count how many rotations, but just understand that the smaller one is undergoing more rotation. Next topic that we did was we looked at different types of energy. Energy is the ability to do work. More on work later on in the video. We said that energy is measured in joules or kilojoules if we've got a lot of energy. The American or imperial unit of energy, which you've probably heard of, is the calorie. Because what we actually do when we measure calories in food is we're measuring its energy content. How much energy are you going to get from this food? So calories are actually, people think of them as unhealthy. They're not really, they're energy. Problem is, is if you have a lot of calorie rich food and then you don't go run a marathon and use that energy, well then that's not good. You need to use the energy that you provide your body. Don't waste it. So a couple of different types of energy. Electrical energy, which a lot of you are familiar with, is electrons running through wires. Radiant energy is energy from light or electromagnetic radiation. Whether it's a light bulb, whether it's the sun, I'm going to call that radiant energy. We could also say solar energy is a type of radiant energy, by the way. Thermal energy is heat. By the way, the hotter something is, the faster its particles are moving. Chemical energy is the energy stored in molecular bonds. So when we break bonds, like we did when we combusted that, uh, remember the gummy bear that we blew up? Well, we were breaking bonds and we were unleashing a whole pile of energy. We get that energy when we break bonds. The other demo we did like that, if you remember, was the Christmas cracker that I brought in. When you break that bond, there was this big explosion, sort of big. So that is chemical energy. It's the energy released from the bonds when we break apart molecules. Speaking of breaking things, what if we actually broke an atom, the nucleus of an atom? Well, for most atoms, not a lot, I guess, would happen. But for big atoms like uranium and plutonium, things that we haven't really looked at much on the periodic table, those nuclei are really, really big and very, very unstable. If we hit them with something, they can break off and then crash into other atoms and break them and then break them and then break them. And we get this big chain reaction that unleashes a ridiculous amount of energy. That's what nuclear energy is. It gives us a ton of energy, but it's very tough to control because it's a chain reaction. It's kind of like imagine setting up a big domino run and then just everything goes down at once. Lots of energy, but difficult to control and can be dangerous. So wind energy, the next one is just the energy of moving air, whether it's natural or from a fan. 
Hydraulic energy is the energy from moving water. Sound energy is energy that's carried by sound waves. Sound waves are just vibrations of air particles that we hear as different types of sound. Elastic energy is energy stored in an object due to its tension or compression. So if you compress a spring or you stretch an elastic, even though nothing's moving right now, you've given it some energy. When you let go of that elastic and it flings across the room and hits somebody, well, then it's turned into mechanical energy. Uh, mechanical energy is just what I'm going to call the energy associated with anything that is moving, anything that is in motion. So there's many different types of energy. And the last idea that we talked about with energy was transmitting it or transforming it. When you're transmitting something, whether it's energy or hopefully not a virus, um, you are passing it off without changing the type of energy. So the example that we saw was, let's say this power plant produces electrical energy. Well, it's gonna be transmitted to your house, to this really fancy uh, electrical outlet. But we never changed the type of energy. It was always electrical. So this is an example of transmission of energy. Another example, the sun transmits solar energy to Earth. It does not change type along the way. If we do change type, that is what we call transformation of energy. So here we've got a battery. Batteries work because they have chemicals inside of them that give off electricity or that have enough energy to produce electrical energy. So, but it comes from the molecules inside, particularly the battery acid. So because it's from the molecules and their bonds, it's chemical energy. And by the way, a battery is not enough to power a uh, light bulb and a speaker, but let's just roll with it. So a, this is chemical energy that will be transformed. It's changed into electrical energy. When it goes through the light bulb, it gives off light and also heat, thermal energy. So that's radiant energy. Then it'll run through the speaker and give off sound energy. So we have changed types of energy here a few times. That makes it a transformation of energy. Here's another example. A toaster transmits electrical energy into thermal energy, which is hot enough to cook your toast. And if it's this uh, toaster that we have at the Centennial staff room, maybe sound. I don't know if you can hear that through Zoom, but you heard it already. So one more quick example, photosynthesis, everybody's favorite chemical reaction. We take uh, water and carbon dioxide and solar energy. We transform it into oxygen. And of course, our favorite molecule from this year, glucose. When we, glucose, as you know, has a lot of bonds in it. It's a complicated molecule. There's a lot of energy to be had from glucose, which is why when you eat sugar, you get hyper. It's all coming full circle, right? So solar energy has been transformed into chemical energy. One more idea with energy, we talked about work. Work is a very easy calculation to do. It's just the force times the distance that you move something. Force is in Newtons. Delta D, it looks like two things, but it's just one symbol. Delta, by the way, is the triangle. Um, yeah, so let's try an example. If you have a box and you apply 100 Newtons of force to it to drag it, well, how far did we move it? If we moved it five meters, well, then we just do five times 100, and we have done 5,000 joules of work. Work is measured in joules as well, just like energy. I hope my head was not in the way of that. Next, what if you have a brick wall and you apply 5,000 Newtons of force to it, but the wall doesn't budge? Well, then you've done zero work because 5,000 times the distance, which is zero, just comes out to be zero joules. So when you're doing this, take the force multiply it by the distance. The force has to be in Newtons, the distance has to be in meters. Then the last subject we talked about was not golf. It was, uh, that was just a lame joke to make you sign into the Zoom class about, um, about this idea of links. When we connect technical pieces together and we ask ourselves these four questions. The first question we always ask is, is a link direct or indirect? If it's direct, it means that there's no linking component. There's no screw or glue or nail or staple or anything holding the components together. Just like how a bike tire fits over the rim without anything in particular. 
Same with the water bottle, the lid fits on, it doesn't need to be glued on, it doesn't need to be stapled on. Here an indirect link is these two pieces of wood that have been glued together. It needed something else, the glue in this case, to keep them together. Here, it's these little screws. These screws make it indirect. Next question, pretty easy to understand. Is it rigid or flexible? Well, rigid, is it solid? Would it hurt if you got hit by it? I don't know. Um, flexible means what you think it is. Can we bend it or deform it? So this is like a little Rubbermaid lid that we can easily bend. The bike tire, we can stretch to get it off, whereas Lego or pots, particularly Lego, I can tell from stepping on it, is definitely rigid. Next question, is the link removable or permanent? If something is removable, it means you can separate it, like the lid of the water bottle and the bike tire. These are meant to come off without breaking it. If something is permanent, you cannot separate it. If you did manage to separate it, it means that you've broken it and that it won't go back together. One more idea we have to think of, the idea is complete or partial. When something is complete, it means both items move together. For instance, here is a water bottle and I'm gonna connect this lid to it, or the cap. As I move the bottle, the lid moves with it. So this is an example of a complete link. For a partial link, it's the opposite. It means um, I have, for instance, a pair of scissors here and they're connected by the middle here. But when I move one blade, the other moves in a different way. Because they're both able to move independently, we're gonna say that it's a partial link, kind of like a door hinge as well. It's gonna allow movement of the different parts. A couple of examples that we went over, you can pause this and try it again if you want. Here are the definitions. Here are some Lego pieces. Well, this is direct, there's no glue or anything. They're rigid, if you don't believe me, try stepping on it. Removable, you can take apart Lego pieces. And complete, as I move one of these Lego bricks, the other ones that are connected are gonna move with it. This screwdriver, um, there is no glue or anything in there, so it's direct. It's definitely rigid, it's permanent, this is not meant to come apart, and it's complete. As you turn the handle of the screwdriver, the metal component will move with it. The scissors, like I did a moment ago, indirect because you've got this little uh, device here that's holding them together. It's not by itself. Rigid, definitely. Permanent, this little piece is not meant to come out. If you have separated your scissor blades, they are broken. And partial, as I mentioned, because both blades can move independently. These pot lid, uh, this pot has these little, the handle and these little uh, devices as well that keep the handle connected to the actual pot. Indirect, because we've got these things. Rigid, very solid. Permanent, they're not meant to come out and complete. As you turn the handle, the pot moves with it. One more example, this Rubbermaid container. Uh, the lid is not glued on or stapled on, so it's direct. It's flexible, we can bend it off. It's removable, it's meant to come off, and it's complete because if you move the container, the lid moves with it, I would hope. So we did this. If you want, you can pause this and try it again. See if you can come up with your own examples that are not from this video of different types of links. That was a lot of topics, but with that, we are officially finished Sec 2 Science. I officially declare you ready for Sec 3. Thank you for watching all these videos. Thank you for keeping up with everything and for uh, putting up with the many bad jokes and long explanations that have come with this. Uh, so before we go, here is, I'll send you off with one more little montage. And I did promise I'd lift a car, right? So stay tuned. Dum, da -dum, dum, dum. Da -da -dum. Da -dum, dum, dum. I ain't working out never. I ain't getting no stronger. I'm trading force for displacement, multiply and conquer. Break out that lever I'm gonna make it longer Get that mechanic advantage and I won't get tired You know I always hoped I might live But I can't budge these grades alone Oh, I need an in-complex contraption Yeah, to boost the bars and lift the load You ain't gotta feel the work, work, work Work, but you gotta put in work, 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 work,
work, they work, 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 Trying to figure out the tension Look at Newton's laws of motion Counteracting one force with two rows So you gotta take a quotient Spread the work out broadly You can lift a heavy body Ah, with the displacement Replacing the force You don't need to be burly Oh yeah I know you pros out there You might leave Without a program This is make it work, 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 work. Press the pulleys, yeah, they work, 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 work. Put it work too loud. Oh, oh, put it work too loud. Oh, yeah. Bro, can you live for me? Zero delta X, hold there for me. Ain't no work now, figure that for me. When are you still putting out energy? Acting, binding repeatedly. Keep running through that ATP <laughs> Muscle tension's constantly <laughs> But the protein's throwing off heat Whoa, so we think Push a pull Take some power as a rule Well, surprise, that ain't true Just a force, don't need jack But of course you think that Spending all your time in your body All that time in your body Yeah, you gotta work that low I told you I'd lift a car.